afternoon, everyone. This is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Uh, it's Tuesday, January 25th, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. We're back from a break. Um, we also um, have House Education joining us this afternoon. Um, we're happy to have them uh, sit in with us uh, as we start talking about uh, education, career centers, uh, the CPE system. Um, we're happy to have with us uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher from the Agency of Education, Jay Ramsey. And I've also invited uh, former Representative Michelle Coopersmith to be with us as well. Um, Michelle and I, when she was here, worked a lot on workforce. Michelle, I consider someone who has put a lot of time, energy, and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, thought into uh, this realm that we're talking about. Um, we were always passionate about um, the career centers and apprenticeships and internships. And so um, I've asked Michelle to also um, give us her perspective. Uh, so uh, Kate, did you want to, uh, would you like to say uh, or introduce your committee to everyone? I think we all know each other, but um, people in the, on the virtual world don't know us. I think we're okay. We have all uh, the whole committee here uh, representing various districts around the, the state. And I know that our committee knows the faces. So <laughs> thank you so much for including us on this really important question. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to be sure that uh, both committees, uh, any anyone uh, who would like to ask a question, uh, just uh, let the on people on education let your chair know. Um, Representative uh, uh, Webb could uh, can uh, call on you, um, and same for for uh, my committee members. Just let us know if you have questions. So I think what I'd like to do first is uh, ask Michelle Cooper Smith to uh, just start us off. Um, Michelle, welcome. Uh, glad to see you again. It's been a while since uh, we've been able to touch base, but I hope all is well with you and, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Well, hi. I, I thought I would go third, but I'm happy to do this. And I'm so pleased, uh, Kate and your team, that, that this is a joint committee meeting. I didn't realize that till this morning. So that's pretty cool. Um, so let me just, I got a few little notes, but mostly this is, this is me. It's just my perspective and it's, it, it sets the stage for how I have evolved in my thinking over the years. And then you'll get, you're just gonna get Jay and Heather who are such experts in this and it's gonna be great. So this, the whole topic of CTE, it's just huge. It's huge for the individuals, the students. It's huge for the community and its health, and it's huge for our economy. And what I'm gonna, <laughs> my pitch to you is, is that there are two things happening with uh, this CTE system that has not gone as far as I believe that it could and should. One is it's, it's really an injustice to the individuals um, who aren't able to access the system or for whom the system is not robust enough. And, and from an economic standpoint, we just shoot ourselves in the foot. Um, and I'll talk about that. And really just starting right at the very top, every day, and I know that, I know this is true, I believe this is true, that our kids in K through 12 system, the messaging is to them, we want you to aspire to go to college. We will help you prepare for college. We believe in you and we believe that you have what it takes to go to college. But if college isn't right for you, then we'll send you to tech ed. And I just wanna say this is a big deal. Why is college the default? Why is college the gold standard and CTE is less than? And this is, you ask any plumber and electrician or tradesperson in this state, 
who didn't go to college or other people, and they will say that I'm not wrong about this. This is the truth of the message that our policies bring to our kids. So the question is, why is college the aspiration? I've understood for quite a long time that, um, that only 27% of our jobs in the state of Vermont require a four-year degree or greater. And I heard, I caught a snippet of Betsy Bishop testifying the other day. She said only 20% the Vermont Futures Project would have the uh, exact data on that. And, and that's a job that's for four-year degrees, but we're talking about um, four-year degrees. So I've had a lifetime, not just my work as a legislator, to witness the system and how it's been over the years. And I can tell you what I've heard from virtually everybody in the system and people. And they mostly say in various words, as I push for CTE and more training programs, they say to me, they said to me as a legislator, they said to me as one who engaged in these conversations, how dare you deny individuals the aspiration for and the chance to go to college? I, this is true. <laughs> this is my big experience. And let me just pause and say, this is not an anti-college speech, even though it, it clearly sounds like that at the moment. It's not. I mean, I have been lucky to have a college degree and an advanced degree and my kids the same. And, and it is the world that I have been privileged to be part of. But this is a question about what is the truth about what we owe our Vermont kids. And this is something that I've cared about since high school. <laughs> and then certainly when I was in my seat in the house. Um, and to be fair, almost everyone, all the educators, the administrators, and the parents all say, of course we value the trades and those who do them. And they say it and they mean it. They're sincere. I believe they're absolutely sincere. But they go on to tell me why what I suggest that is a great expansion of the programs of study in our K through 12 CTE system, they say why it won't work. And um, and they and I've been told these things over and over and over again. And you've probably already heard the list. These are not just obstacles. These are big impediments, emotionally, psychologically, administratively, financially, in every way. So here's some of the list. Under the current CTE system, if you send more kids to CTE, school principals are going to have to lay off academic teachers. It's just true. Now they will say they never don't send a kid to CTE for that reason, but if they go over X number, they run out of money. I mean, it's just plain true. They say, they, this is the big they, that CTE is training. It's not education. It's not education. They call it training. They say CTE trains students in a narrow set of skills for a job. And that job is gonna be obsolete by the time they graduate. That's what they believe. That's what they say. This is what's out there as the narrative. They say tax dollars in our K through 12 system should not be paying for what businesses are supposed to do. They say, it's not our job to train kids. That's for the businesses to do and to pay for. They say that students won't lear learn good citizenship in CTE programs. They won't learn about democracy. They won't learn these things. They say that students won't learn the three R's. They won't really learn how to read. They won't really learn math. And they won't um, learn how to write in CTE. They say this all the time, <laughs> truly they do. They say that student CTE students don't become lifelong learners, that they don't develop 
critical thinking skills. This is said all the time. I have heard it so many times over the years. They say that students won't go on to college if they attend CTE, they won't aspire to, and they won't get in, they won't get admitted if they go to CTE. They say students won't be successful in college if they get in, if they attend CTE first. They say that what I wanna do is what the Swiss and the Germans do, and they track their students, and that those tracked tech ed won't get it, they can't go on to college, to university, as it's called there. And, um, and that those who are tracked early like this are stigmatized for life as having not succeeded in the uh, more elite academic route. They say that the path to gaining middle and upper class status is college. They say it in a lot of different words, but it's clear that's what they're saying. And they say that studies show that college graduates out earn those with basic high school degrees. Well, I won't get into the weeds on that, but you do the dig on the, on the data. And you wanna know the worst one ever? <laughs> one of the fun things you all know, you become a legislator, you have both the stress and also the privilege of getting into some high level heated discussions. And I got into a lot of those. And in one of them in particular, I pointed out that students at the Center for Technology Essex, this goes back a while, not telling you who it was or anything, I don't even remember who it was, but a superintendent said to me, and I said, you know, they've got this great fast forward program Kids can actually get college credit for a class taken in their CTE curriculum with their CTE teacher in the high school building. Um, and he said to me, so, and, and I was saying, these are kids who are college tracked. And he said, so now you wanna take our smart kids. Well, you can imagine <laughs> how I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm hearing it and I'm indignant as a Vermonter, but I'm also, it, those are the experiences, all of those bullets that make me acutely aware that this is a, this is a big thing <laughs> and it's got deep roots and it's got all the financial roots and it's got all the emotional roots and it sure is a mess administratively to try to coordinate. I heard earlier a conversation just about um, in the earlier testimony in commerce just about how hard it is. Kids think they can just access one or two CTE classes and stay in the academic track and how hard it is. So I can only get in trouble if I go into the weeds, but I can say there's so much at stake for our society and our community and for the growing polarization between people and this greater stratification of class. And it all starts when the kids are younger and it, our messaging around CTE feeds that and the reality of it feeds that. So I encourage you to look heavily and I'm a huge proponent of apprenticeships and internships and training programs. And, but we absolutely, totally in my mind, need to spend significant more money in our programs of study delivered to our kids before they turn 18 or 19 years old and truly make what's in Vermont law true. And that is the kids by law are supposed to be able to graduate from high school, career and college ready. And we're not one of the, <laughs> we got some of the best experts in the country. Our CTE directors at the local schools, our administrators 
Heather and Jay and others, all the brain power is there and the will is there, but the policy is not there. And that's the job of the legislature. It's a policy question. So it cannot be passed on to the lower levels because they can only work within the system. So thank you, that's it. <laughs> I'm so pleased to see most of you. I don't even know, I'm pleased to see all of you. I don't know some of you. Michelle, thank you. Thank you. It was, uh, I think, a great opening to this whole discussion. Um, I knew you could lay it out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> when you get old enough and you you just say, I mean, it's, it's, this is what I believe. It's not, it's a big deal. It's actually a very big deal. Thank you, both of you chairs and the rest of you. Thanks, Michelle. Are there any questions for Michelle before we continue on? Nothing here. Michelle, we really appreciate it. Thank you. And sure, uh, I'll be touching base with you over the session to make sure that we're going in the right direction. Well, I'm not as busy as the rest of you, so I'm available. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Michelle. Deputy Secretary Boucher, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Nice to see all of you. I am also excited that this is a joint testimony, which makes our lives a little bit easier selfishly because we don't have to do two, two testimonies then. <laughs> um, for the record, uh, I'm Heather Boucher, the Deputy Secretary for Education, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jay Ramsey, uh, who is our former state uh, CTE director and is uh, currently our Assistant Division Director for Student Pathways. And um, I am going to start the testimony by um, just laying out um, some of the proposals that are in the administration's uh, budget uh, proposal so that we can actually think about, I think many of those um, are addressing some of the issues that um, Ms. Cooper Smith, would, that Michelle just brought up. So I'd like to start out by that. And then of course, both Jay and I are, are here for questions, um, if that's okay, uh, Mr. and Madam Chair. Great, Perfect. and I did send ahead um, some uh, three uh, documents that I hope you were able to take a look at. So um, I think as folks probably know, um, Governor Scott is uh, very um, uh, supportive of CTE. Uh, he speaks about it uh, quite a lot. Um, he is also very concerned, as you know, about um, what is happening statewide in terms of a shortage of workers in all sectors, but certainly in the trades um, and certainly in healthcare um, as a result of um, uh, what's happening with the pandemic. Uh, so backing um, some of the policy ideas that our administration has come up with, um, he has released a suite of different uh, one to two page documents that um, highlight uh, what has been, uh, what we're, we're starting with as some ideas um, from, um, in this case, the Agency of Education. Um, and there are some similar uh, documents that are, are being um, discussed with uh, relevant committees of jurisdiction with pretty much all of um, the agencies and departments um, throughout state government. So um, one of the things that um, we know is really critical is that um, in terms of our education system, PK-12, we really do rely on our CTE system writ large as a bulwark of, of really uh, ensuring that we have the workforce that we need. Um, of the future. Um, I do want to point out, I think folks are quite aware of this, but just as a, as a further clarification if needed, when I'm talking about CTE, I'm including both secondary CTE, which is uh, high school in statute, but also includes more and more, um, our framework includes seventh, sixth and seventh grade on up to 12th grade. And then we also have adult technical education, um, which is um, for folks who actually already have um, a high school diploma. 
So uh, it's really important to actually distinguish between those two when we're when we're talking about things, because uh, right now, in terms of the governance and funding, um, it's not very streamlined. And I can answer any questions about that um, moving forward. So the suite of initiatives um, proposed by um, the Scott administration for uh, CTE um, work um, to solve um, our workforce challenges um, has a number of different components that I thought I would just kind of um, run through. And then um, they're in different levels of um, specificity and activity. And so I'll give um, a brief update on each of them. Um, the first as, um, I know our education uh, committee members know, I'm not sure about um, uh, commerce committee, but there is uh, currently a $90 million surplus in the education fund. And so um, one of the primary uh, proposals that the governor has is first to return half of that uh, surplus back to the taxpayers, which is not surprising given that um, he has built his platform for years on um, and reducing the tax burden for our residents. And then also um, the other half of that surplus, so another $45 million, he'd, he's proposing that we actually uh, invest that in our CTE system in terms of infrastructure so that we can actually use these dollars to really um, make sure that uh, our CTE facilities uh, are modern, um, have what they need um, to be uh, functional as um, buildings. Um, and part of this is so that they can actually fully train and um, educate students that are in their programs. Part of this is also stemming from the fact that there are dollars available um, to through ESSER um, th to, and other some other dollars, but primarily through ESSER right now for um, construction for our K-12 um, non-CTE um, infrastructure. And so um, the idea is to hopefully provide some of those additional um, supports for our CTE buildings, which were often built at the same time as our, as our schools. And so they're, they're facing the same deferred maintenance and, and um, challenges as our, as our schools are. So, um, and then um, there are um, two proposals um, that directly relate to funding and governance changes um, to CTE. Um, both of those are currently bills that have emerged in house ed and um, they have been jointly developed by uh, Representative Kimball and Representative James uh, with uh, our feedback um, early in the process, I believe over the summer, definitely fall, but I think even starting in the summer um, to bring these to fruition. So um, one is H483, which is um, proposing to continue the work that was done um, by, uh, started by this committee, um, uh, by the House Commerce Committee um, a couple of years ago with um, pilot project that would actually allow CTEs to think outside the box in terms of governance and funding. And um, we made some good progress uh, in those pilots. And now the new bill asks us to basically finalize that work um, so that we can actually um, bring that um, initial um, activity to bear and actually help us actually build what the new system for CTE should look like, which is directly, I think, related to what Michelle Cooper Smith was talking about. And uh, so that's H483. And then um, the second um, bill that is relevant is um, piloting, um, and this is kind of a new idea, but we think it will be um, potentially um, a wonderful addition to um, the curricular space for CTE students. So um, thinking about um, how we could actually design um, a virtual high school, uh, that CTE students could um, use as their high school um, so that they could actually uh, complete their core courses. Um, so the um, uh, graduation requirements that they need to graduate that are not the CTE courses. So it would allow them to have more time in the CTEs doing work um, that's the hands-on um, training and um, the advanced uh, work that they are actually at the CTE center to do. Um, and one of the pieces that's also interesting is it could actually, if we design it well, could actually get at the issue that um, 
all different students have different uh, proficiency based graduation requirements that are coming to the same CTE center. And so if we can mm -hmm. streamline this and, and, and think about um, having um, CTE students attend a virtual high school, um, that would be the same high school for CTE students, um, it could bring us um, much further in terms of streamlining. So that is um, one of the parts of the proposal um, that um, have also been um, brought forth from the administration. And I believe that is uh, H468 um, that is um, uh, put together uh, within house education. Um, let's see. And then um, we did have, the governor did have a proposed uh, budget adjustment act, um, including a, a, an, in, a sum of one and a half million dollars um, from the ed fund uh, to provide to all of our CTE centers. Um, we, uh, House Ed was working on this. Um, we were actually still doing some of our calculations of how um, our proposal would work. We've, I've sent that on. Um, to all the committee members as part of um, today's testimony. I believe this has moved forward in House appropriations. Uh, we did testify last week in Senate appropriations. I don't know where that currently is. Um, we could perhaps talk more about that. In our view, what we're trying to do is um, stabilize the entire CTE system. Um, there have been uh, some other pieces of testimony that came um, that came up, which specifically relate to the independent, the three independent tech centers. Um, I think it's unfortunate from our perspective that proposals got almost pitted against each other as um, do you support this, um, this independent center proposal or do you support the proposal that would have given um, uh, dollars to all CTE centers, and I'll tell you why that's important in just a sec, um, that would have been based on their um, their usual uh, headcount um, prior and um, during the beginning of COVID. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate, I think, that from our perspective that that happened and, and we're still hopeful that we can actually get some um, financial assistance to all of the tech centers, not just the three independent um, tech centers. So the reason we came up, um, we put this forth is that um, it, it might seem that um, that the CTE centers, for instance, that were co-located with a high school did just fine given all of the ESSER dollars that had gone to the education system. However, that's just not true. And um, our CTE folks put together um, the document that you can see, which is kind of a straw poll of what ESSER dollars were actually awarded to each of the CTEs um, through the LEAs. And I believe um, one of the largest, what was Burlington, which received or will receive $60,000 um, towards um, COVID uh, relief. And, you know, we would, I think all agree that's just simply not enough. Um, part of the, the big challenge is that the federal um, rules, the, the way the law was written actually precluded uh, technical centers across the nation from actually having direct access to any of those education dollars, unless they were, um, uh, a district as defined by uh, federal law, so an LEA, um, and ours are not. That's that's just the way our system is set up. So, um, where, regardless of whether they were um, co-located, regardless of whether they were actually independent, regardless of whether they were sending school CTEs, um, none of them had direct access to ESSER, and so that's why we had proposed. Here are, here's um, you know, some modest dollars to help stabilize each of the tech centers in the breach. Um, then um, there are GEAR funds, which are also federal um, COVID relief dollars. Um, GEAR 1 was used um, for the CTE system to help primarily provide, they could um, apply for grants, which they all did to get um, PEE, so uh, personal, um, you know, um, safety equipment um, in, in terms of the actual uh, management of um, the first uh, wave of the pandemic. With the second, so there's a second pot of gear dollars, which we call gear two, and um, the governor uh, has directed one and a half million dollars of that um, to the agency so that um, we will run a statewide campaign uh, promoting um, the uh, um, advantages of CTE, promoting um, the, the 
great opportunities that CTE affords um, for younger students and for current high school students and for adult students and also um, for um, parents. And so we're going to use um, the, those dollars. So a, a portion of year two will be used to actually um, hire um, a vendor, uh, which we call in state language, basically a contractor um, to work with us to do that um, big campaign about really making sure that um, everyone understands fully what CTE looks like. Um, the trades are an important part of it. It's not just the trades. Um, and so we want to actually um, certainly, um, we can talk more about that with um, this committee and I'm happy to hear your thoughts on that. And then another um, smaller portion of the, those gear two dollars, the governor will be uh, using them to launch two to three programs in uh, electrical um, aviation and um, uh, transportation, so electric vehicles um, in the state. And the idea there is twofold. One, um, it pushes us forward a little bit more in terms of our sustainability and um, our carbon footprint as a state it helps us continue making that work. Um, and then also um, because I forgot to say, um, many of our CTE centers actually experienced a decline in student participation as they've gone through COVID. Um, the idea is that really getting a couple of these really neat um, electric, you know, electric helicopter, electric um, airplane um, programs up and running can actually really serve as a, a neat recruitment tool uh, for both hopefully girls and boys um, to get them excited about CTE and get them thinking about it. Um, the only other two pieces I would say is that um, we are supporting authorizing language um, in the budget adjustment as well that um, will allow Vermont Technical College to continue the work that I think was started um, in the Commerce Committee, if I'm not mistaken, to um, have um, VTC courses um, taking place um, at the CTE centers. And my understanding is that may have been waylaid also by the pandemic. And so it's um, an attempt to kind of reboot that work and, and kind of keep it moving forward. Perhaps Jay can help me and knows a little bit more about that component than I do. Um, and then lastly, um, there is a new proposal on the table in partnership um, with labor to um, design some um, more localized regional um, units that actually um, meld um, training employers and CTE centers together to really help them um, find those connections more easily. Some of the pieces that Michelle Cooper Smith was talking about. Um, and um, locally working together to, to identify what the specific barriers are in that particular region with that particular district uh, or set of school districts and um, with the assistance of the state actually really try to hammer through those. Again, against the backdrop of, we hope, the broader um, funding and governance structure reform that's so desperately needed. I have been um, very fond of saying you know, as, as Michelle um, hinted at, Jay and I have been doing this work for a long time, and um, I have been very fond of saying, we know that um, the last thing left is the least sexy, which is <laughs> funding and governance um, uh, improvement, but if we don't do that, we're, we're just not going to really see what we need to see in terms of uh, making sure that our CTE system is, um, you know, top of the line, um, a national leader, and certainly is uh, meeting the needs of our state. Jay, did you have anything else you might wanna add? Um, I kind of just went through the whole gamut. Um, I think you've touched on every uh, thing that we have identified as initiatives. I would also say school counseling has been um, a growing focus of our work. We uh, put out a a statewide survey last February on to better understand what school counselors were needing and um, particularly during the pandemic, but also about uh, what their needs were related to career counseling, since that is a critical component of all of this. So that's what I had prepared to say, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, and I'm happy for questions or, or 
what lies next in the conversation. I have Thank two you. in our committee, uh, Representative Markov, if you, do you want to kick it off? And... Okay. Go ahead, Madam Chair. Okay, um, Representative Williams and then Representative Conlon. Yes, thank you. Um, I am looking at the ESSER funds for CTE uh, sheet that you gave us, and I don't see anything there for Linden Institute Tech or St. John's Rear Academy Tech. Are they receiving ESSER funds? Yes, Yeah, that's a great question. That was my question at first too. Um, so those are two independent um, schools and they actually had access to what are called Ian's funds, ESSER Ian's funds, E-A-N-S, that were actually set aside dollars specifically for private or independent schools. So they both got funding directly um, through those, um, through those, through that set of, um, COVID relief dollars. So really um, the CTE centers, and then also um, as the education committee heard about the adult education system um, in Vermont really are the two entities that did not have direct access to any COVID dollars. And we could get thank those you. amounts amounts for you if you'd like as well. Yes, if thank I, you. If I may add to Heather's response about Linden Institute and St. John's Bay Academy, Early in the pandemic, the governor identified um, the gear one funds. So the governor's emergency education relief funds for technical education, that was about $4 million. Um, and we followed a process that we followed for our other federal funds for technical education that they went to a consortium of the public supervisor unions in the region and through that consortium, um, Linden and St. Johnsbury had access to 457,000 uh, of the gear funds. That's not- And the they had of, Ian's, yep. And, and they, had, they had Ian's dollars, which we can get, sorry to cut you off, Jay, which we can actually get the, the figures on. It's a great question. And just for, for new folks, when I say independent CTE centers, I'm not talking about those two, which is confusing. Um, I'm actually talking about three CTE centers, which are independent districts. And so those are um, River Valley or Springfield, um, Hannaford Center in Middlebury, and then Southwest Vermont Career Center. Um, just to confuse folks. Not, I'm kidding, it's not meant to confuse you, but it can be confusing. <laughs> thank you, Representative Conlon. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, when can we expect a more detailed fleshed out proposal about the surplus education fund dollars? Yeah, I think I think this is um, where the administration is right now because we're really hoping to partner and come up with some of those ideas together. Um, in this space, uh, I think the focus um, from the governor's perspective, his, his hope is that we can actually frame that around infrastructural um, in, in investments and enhancements. Um, so I think um, we really do want to, the reason that one is so open is because I think the administration really wants to work with the General Assembly to come up with what that might look like. Could you lay out the, the, the roadway, the path that that, that collaboration is going to take place? Um, you know, I think typically that, and this is above my, um, sorry to say, but pay grade, but I think that technically happens when um, the leaders of um, the House and Senate um, meet with the governor and, and, and talk about um, some mutual um, spaces of policy development that they'd like to work on. I think that is perhaps what's hoped, hoped for, but I can certainly um, bring that back and, and get some additional information um, from the governor's office um, to more specifically answer the question. Okay, thank you. Um, do you I've got another question, but I, Representative Markov, do you, shall we go okay. with another question? Or? <laughs> for the time being. Go, go, go ahead. Okay, Representative Austin. Austin. Yes, um, here I'm glad to hear um, Deputy Boucher about the electric cars, um, you know, and, and electric energy. I'm wondering if there's any more 
thinking and looking at what are the future jobs in the next five to 10 years that Vermont is gonna need, and then backing that down to the state colleges and even you know, junior high and high school to kind of make kid, you know, students aware that these are the skills and knowledge to, that, that are jobs that, where they could stay in Vermont and make a good living. Yeah, um, thank you, Representative Austin. It's a great point. And I'm sorry if I gave the impression that that wasn't part of the calculus going into this. It, it certainly is. Um, I think um, from the administration's perspective, um, the real core um, work that needs to be done in the next three years or so will be in the trades. So some of those areas that we know have been um, really decimated in terms of um, bodies to do the work. We hear about it every session. And a lot of that is because we have a big um, COVID relief infrastructure bill that um, will actually be providing dollars for um, construction, roads, infrastructure, um, uh, broadband, those kinds of things. And so I think that's where some of that pressure is coming from, that we don't really have the workforce right now to actually lift those federal dollars that we know are coming. And then secondly, um, we know, um, particularly with respect to um, CTE, we know that because there are um, health science um, programs that are, that are um, you know, a, a core part of CTE uh, programs in each of our centers, um, we know that the um, healthcare industry already was facing some significant challenges and shortages, particularly with the aging of um, not only the population in New England, but nationally. And then also the COVID epidemic has only made that worse. Um, we have nursing shortages, we have folks that are um, just really getting burned out. Um, so those are the two for this particular um, focus this year. But, um, you know, I, I think our administration has always been interested in what are um, those um, those fields or, or those positions across many sect across a multiple multitude of sectors that we really need to make sure our state is thriving. Um, and we know that we have shortages across all sectors. So, um, so there is a focus on um, trades and healthcare for the short term, but definitely that long term view is all about like what, how do we actually make those connections between um, the jobs that are actually going to be available in Vermont and actually are you know needed to actually help stabilize our economy and help uh, help our state thrive, and then what we're offering um, in terms of in terms of um, our um, CTE programs. And I also think um, the the electric aviation, um, to some extent, the thinking is it's a really novel, neat, cool idea that a lot of students might not know about. And so it could be a hook to get them into thinking about CTE because who doesn't wanna learn how to build um, an electric helicopter or, or plane? I do. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just I'm specifically thinking of just, you know, the forest industry, the um, outdoor recreation industry, the climate uh, economy, um, you know, there's two or three that are the, you know, there are two or three that I've been, I think need jobs now, you know, need workers now, and um, I think projected into the future, they'll need them and it seems like it would be a good uh, match. If I may, <laughs> um, on some on some level, when we're talking about the secondary CTE programs, um, we're talking about introducing concepts to students. And so to your question about the climate workforce, if we're talking about a construction program, you know, we're talking also about weatherization, learning how to install windows so that, you know, air doesn't leak around them. There's all sorts of, um, topics that can be used to update the curriculum. And so, you know, I think we have to walk a careful line here in response to what um, Michelle Coopersmith was saying when she started, it's not about an occupation. We're not creating programs that are leading to a particular occupation. We're introducing students to a career path. Through construction, you can be an electrician, you can be an HVAC technician, you could you can be a window installer, you can be a weatherization expert. And so I, I just want us to be careful when we're talking about it, that we, we, want, we want it to lead 
to something. We, we know that, um, at least from the Center for Education and Work at Georgetown, 70% of jobs uh, by 2025, 2025 will require some amount of post-secondary education. So we're, we have to identify the credentials and have them be stackable so someone can over a lifetime build a career. Um, and I also wanna speak to the development of programs. The, we've provided as an agency um, in the legislature allocates in um, normal times, whatever that means, um, $750,000 for new program development. And those are funds that we grant out to the technical centers. They use it to update their curriculum, buy equipment, um, and implement new programs. So for instance, at um, Randolph, they have implemented a dental assisting program and that, that's the second one in the state. Um, the other one is at Essex. And, and that leads to um, a federal process that the centers are having to do uh, this spring um, called the Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment. And in that process, they're examining their local labor market or their regional labor market we, we had UVM prepare some reports for each tech center based on their service region. And they have to go through a process basically of justifying why are they offering the programs that they're offering? And if there is a program that's misaligned, what are they going to do about it? Do they need to train the teacher? Do they need to update the curriculum? Do they need to discontinue the program and start something else? So we'll see the results of that. Um, hopefully, you know, late spring, um, early summer, as they submit their Perkins applications. Thank you so much. Charlie? Well, good no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Good. You all right? We're, we're good. Okay, um, thank you. I just had a, a couple of different questions. Um, Heather, I think you mentioned the ESSER grants being uh, able to fund school construction. And I haven't seen that. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can talk to that because when we look at $45 million going into the career and technical education centers, I, I don't know that there's that necessary need for it, but I know there's over 500 million in school construction projects that have been proposed. So can you talk about the ESSER funds for school construction? Hmm. Um, it could be um, a certain component of the ESSER funds. I would actually have to have Jill um, come in and talk with you about that, Jill Briggs Campbell, because she actually is our ESSER guru and there's all different kinds of, oh, rabbit holes where certain, um, certain dollars can be used for certain things um, and not for others. I do know that with ESSER, I believe $1, we actually invested um, in our state set aside, we invested in um, a contractor to um, help um, develop um, facilities plans that I think we're going to be using those local um, education dollars, but I wanna actually go back and just confirm all those pieces. Okay, thanks. I, I only have a few more pointed questions. So it's, they're, they're short. I mean, not pointed, but short. Uh, sure. Uh, for instance, uh, in talking about the adult tech education programs, um, one thing that we've heard of is because very few of them have full-time directors for their adult education programs. And we've heard uh, from testimony that you can see the absolute positive results when there is a full-time adult education technical director uh, on site. And so, um, which would be interesting to get your thoughts on that, if that makes that much of a difference in participation. And then the second part is really looking at the role of the regional advisory boards. As Jay was just talking about developing curriculum uh, around what the perceived needs are really from AOE, wondering how you're leveraging those uh, regional advisory boards and determining what those needs are on the local scale. Yeah, so I'm going to let um, Jay address the uh, regional advisory board piece, and he can certainly also um, round out what I say in terms of the adult education piece. 
you know, I think I think our view is that we want to support anything that um, helps students, regardless of their age, get the right kind of training and education they need. So I, I think the adult technical education uh, system is still really problematic um, because it doesn't have a streamlined governance system. So we can talk about it, but we really don't have any dollars um, in education to support that system. We have a little bit in terms of um, some salary assistance, um, but the bulk of those dollars, um, I think folks know are actually housed within the Department of Labor. Thankfully, we work very closely together, labor and education at the state level to actually work in concert and, and co-develop um, programs, um, internships, um, and um, a streamlined system. I would actually argue that um, we probably also should be thinking about adult basic education in that same vein <laughs> and think about um, how um, those uh, programs are could be are currently deployed or could be deployed um, to really help um, adult learners who have left the um, K-12 system and are still um, you know, looking to finish their diploma, how to help them actually get um, really teed up and, and um, intrigued by, or at least learn about um, CTE pathways. So um, we support, um, you know, we support ways that we actually uh, need to make sure that we're delivering the education we need to get to our students. Jay, anything um, you'd add there? Um, I mean, I, I think, I'm, I'm coming from a, uh, an informed perspective. Our state CTE director is a former adult CTE coordinator. And so, um, you know, our, our current rules say each center must employ a person. It doesn't say how much. Um, and so I think we could look at all of the examples where there is a full-time person and see that there are results. I don't disagree with that part of the testimony. Does each center need to have a full-time person, I think is the question. Could the center in St. Albans and the center in Cold Hollow employ one person who coordinates between the two sites? Could Burlington and Essex do the same thing? So, you know, again, we need to step back a little bit and say, what is the right organizational structure, if you will, for, for that system? And I would echo what Heather is saying about um, adult education and literacy. Um, and I would, um, remind everyone that in Act 74 of last session, there is a study um, that we, we just had our first meeting last week um, with a, a, cons <laughs> a group around the state to um, start looking at adult CTE and adult education and literacy. I was hoping you would mention that. <laughs> And uh, if I may respond to your RAB question, um, each center that receives a Perkins grant or that is intending to apply for Perkins money, Perkins is a federal grant program that funds career and technical education um, at the secondary and the post-secondary level, CCV and Vermont Tech receive Perkins. Um, the RAB is an integral part of that process in each region. So the tech center directors are um, going through this comprehensive local needs assessment process. And when they get to the end, it comes to their regional advisory board. There's probably some other steps that I'm missing, but to simplify it, the regional advisory board has to sign off on the Perkins application before it gets submitted to us. So those um, high school administrators that are on the RAB, business and industry partners that are on the RAB have to sign off on kind of the justification, if you will, for continuing certain programs, discontinuing some, or starting new ones. Mm, that's interesting. Lynn? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was the chair of a, I was involved with a high school board with the technical center for many years, um, involved in all of the, I was the representative to the technical center from the board as were many others. Um, one of the things that Michelle mentioned, of course, is the fact that these are sort of second class places, second class students, second class citizens. They, there's lack of, there's lack of counseling, lack of incentive to go and 
really do the things they probably need to do. I didn't see that in our high school. Um, I wondered, and maybe Heather and Jay, I don't know which is the rest, best one to ask, but do you have data on what has been done with these schools, with people coming out of these programs, going on to college or post-secondary education, whether it's New England Culinary School or some auto mechanic school out in Idaho or Chicago or someplace, um, not to mention colleges and other places. It seems to me that there is a whole lot more of that now than there might've been back in the 50s and early 60s that there is now a recognition that these are real educational environments. Um, I don't know, we had a course, we had a course at BFA that was, I mean, these kids went on and won an, a national award mm -hmm. in robotics or something. And all of those kids I think went to college in, in engineering school. I mean, the point of it is, is that you must have some data on this. And the second question I have is, my experience with CTEs and both as a person who's involved with um, programs with the business and also as a, just an observer who's really involved in education over the years is that some of the CTE centers are uneven. You can have really, really good programs and really good people. It's a personality-based thing when you have a really good person and they're running the program like crazy and it's, they're attracting students and they're doing a great job. And then five years later, someone else has taken over and it's not so hot. What do you do about that? I mean, that's an ongoing issue. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting to me that I'm, I'm learning things that I didn't realize. I'm learning that the money for this, for these adult basic adult education personnel is coming out of DOL. It's not coming, coming out of AOE. That's an interesting- For technical education, Representative Yes, Dickinson. for CTE, yes, for CTE <laughs> for adult education. But for regular yeah, adult sure. education, for regular adult education, it does come out of the agency of education. It's okay, so really adult basic is okay. Adult basic ed, and I mean, we have a lot of teachers, a lot of excuse me, a lot of adult students who go to back to BFA. You know, they they get diplomas, they go to the prom, they go to all the classes. They're in some of the CTE courses and are in the honor society. For you know, I mean, there's a lot of adults out there that I've seen who go back to school and participate. But it's interesting, your adult education for the CTEs is funded out of DOL and not of AOE. But what about the data? And what about the unevenness? What do you I mean? There's some places where I know they're just gangbusters and some places, not so much. Jay, I'm going to let you because you're more on the ground than I am. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, we do collect data. We, we um, have been collecting three-year follow-up data, but there's... Um, there are some problems with that because it uh, requires the instructor to follow up with students three years after they left. So if you okay. took over teaching, um, you're not gonna have that relationship necessarily and um, the students are not likely to respond. We do six month follow-ups um, and we can, uh, we have access to the National Student Clearinghouse, which is basically a repository of data um, from student loan applications is primarily how it gets in there. And we can map students. We've, um, in 2015, we, we underwent this exercise to, to see where students were and um, we could do it again. It just requires some time. Um, so we, we, we can access that type of data. I'm hoping when we uh, start building on this uh, marketing campaign that Heather was talking about, um, with the governor's year two funds that we'll be able to tell the story using data. So we'd be able to say um, more about what percentage of students go on to college and, and what areas and um, what kinds of jobs do they have and how much money does the average student earn? You know, you know real numbers like that, that would be attractive to parents and um, students. Um, and in terms of the quality of I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what you said, quality of administrators or quality of teachers. I think our approach to that has been it's their local decisions. And if the superintendent that is responsible for a technical center has hired someone, it, where it is our job to obviously work with them because that's who the community has appointed as the leader of that school. If I may, just to add a couple points, Jay. Um, so with the with the last point, 
Um, we have invested as a state in uh, training um, CTE teachers because one of the challenges is it's very hard to actually get folks from industry to make the leap into teaching. They often give up um, significant salary. Yeah. Um, so, um, but we still, even with that training program that we've provided, we've still struggled for many years um, to actually um, uh, really um, populate those positions. I would say um, it's actually going to become even more challenging because now we're seeing in the entire education sector is seeing a lot of turnover and resignation of regular classroom teachers. And so um, the administrative churn for our education sector in general is a, a, a big problem as well, Representative Dickinson. Um, and so I'm wondering if um, we have a bigger um, problem at play. So we have a huge turnover in superintendents and in principals. Um, and, you know, we haven't historically had that level of turnover in terms of core teaching staff, like you might see um, in CTE, but I think we're going to start mm -hmm. to see that. However, I do think that there are unique aspects to actually recruiting um, CTE teachers because they do need to have that technical skill. And often that's developed by actually being in the industry and actually working yeah. uh, in those businesses. So um, we'd be very happy to um, think outside the box together and figure out some new ways to recruit. Um, what was the first part of your question? Because I did have um, another thought I had about that one. Oh, the data. The data. Um, yeah, I, you know, I do, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Jay, but even, you know, and, and by the way, I wanted to say the past couple of years, all of our data has been really um, skewed because of the pandemic, just in terms of what actually the districts and um, CTE centers can actually pull together in the context of having to deal with um, the pandemic. But my understanding was, I remember being pleasantly surprised when I actually came to this job, which is now going on eight years, I can't believe that, um, is that a significant portion of our students in CTE do go on to post-secondary. Um, and certainly um, the placement rate in terms of employment is really high um, for all of our, all of our students. Um, so I think um, one of the things that's always been a puzzle is the the post-secondary outcomes are very good for our CTE center students. And so mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we connect that actual fact mm -hmm. with um, getting the, the messaging about CTE um, to parents and, and students um, and community members, frankly? These are great questions. Thank you. Thank you. We do have another Hi. question here. Yeah, Representative Brady. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is probably a bookmark for a future conversation, but I am curious to hear more about the administration's plans, not just for CTEs, but workforce development programming in our K-12 system, pulling from the, the document that you shared um, and what that might look like. Absolutely, you know, better uh, facilities at our CTEs would be phenomenal. I heard you mention a publicity campaign um, I guess I'm, I'm hopeful that the thinking around this, if we're going to, to really look at this system, is that we'll uh, engage in thinking about what happens in the sending schools too and, in, and across our K-12 system and not just um, separately at CTEs. And I hope that, that part of that conversation includes listening to, to students. Sometimes I wonder if we're designing a lot of solutions and <laughs> what we think um, uh, we need and we aren't actually hearing from students, um, both in you know, full time in their, in their schools and in, in CTEs and what the barriers are, what they want, what they need, particularly in the post COVID world as we get there because it's been a formative experience for our students. So I guess I'm hopeful that that's Part of the process before we define all the solutions. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually a great point. And the good news is we are just um, and we're just starting this work. Um, so I think those are really great points. I would say um, our crew at the agency has a very strong track record of reaching out to students. We do um, annual listening tours where we actually go around. Um, and Jay, you can talk more about this and actually get the perspective of students and of educators on the ground. We were doing this before COVID, obviously. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to go, though, in a slightly different direction, Represent <laughs> Representative Brady, which was... Um, we actually are required as part of the state set aside ESSER dollars to do a workforce um, study or, or some workforce um, 
um, review of actual the education workforce. And so we are actually, um, we are, we, we did an RFP to actually um, have, you know, a contract for an entity to do that work with a New England framework. I thought that's where you might be going. So I'm, I was kind of on a different track. <laughs> And we'll do that work too. But yeah, these are great points. Um, I think um, the nice thing about doing a broad-based campaign like that is that we we really can um, think outside the box a little bit more than we usually do. Um, I, I think it's tempting um, as adults often for us to solve the problems. And I do think it's critical um, that we listen to students um, in regular times. And I agree with you, like certainly now in terms of, you know, what does life look like as we as we move into hopefully um, a more um, you know a more um, stable sense of of life and education um, as we move forward? Um, so those are great questions uh, or great points. Um, Jay, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I, the the comprehensive local needs assessment that I. Um, talked about we're requiring um, the tech centers to do surveys of students and um, their faculty and their communities. And so hopefully you all see surveys coming out of the tech center so you can give them feedback. So that informs the investments that they make with the federal money. Um, but, you know, in terms of the the media campaign, we've, we've been doing some, um, you know, thinking about what is it that we want? And one of the things that we want is student involvement. And, uh, you know, in one of the ways would be, is, you know, trying to think through, is there a way we can involve students in the project itself, the digital media um, programs around the state? How can we have this be a learning experience for some students? Um, and then just in terms of what Heather said about a, a listening tour, um, it, it hasn't been an annual one, even though we would like to go out and, and listen to them annually. Uh, a few years ago, we, we did a strategic vision process for CTE, and I went around and listened to students in four of the tech centers just to say, does this feel right? Is this speaking to you? What else do you want us to know? And then, um, and then another way that we engage directly with students is uh, the CTE team has to uh, monitor, review the tech centers for compliance with civil rights laws. That's a federal requirement specific to CTE. And as part of that process, we interview students about their experience in the tech center, um, particularly if uh, you know they're, they're students of a historically marginalized group. So, uh, and then the last part of your <laughs> question, I think was about, um, in my mind, a coordinated curriculum. And yes, that, that is part of what we have envisioned as part of the Act 189 work. It's difficult at this point to try to, to do that. We're, we've started with updating curriculum, uh, the competency standards for each program, and then that will help us communicate kind of downstream to seventh and eighth grade instructors what are the concepts that they could incorporate into their curriculum? It's, it's a, obviously a, a, a long-term strategy that will take a lot of effort. This was done here, I think. Oh. Thank you. Do you have another, another question? We're on. Is that okay, okay Representative Mark? I have, I have one more question, and I know we're going to need to break. So. Um, I think I just want to piggyback on Representative Brady's question. Thank you. Um, that's something that we actually discussed a little bit last week, uh, but more of asking some students to actually testify mm -hmm. with our committee and, and with yours, and maybe we can talk about how that could work, but also to include parents to see what parents are thinking about um because you know we, we're all assuming right now and we're trying to um i i think we we need to hear it directly from the students and directly from parents what are they looking for in their schools and are they looking for more technical education uh and better outcomes for their kids so um yeah i, th I think we should talk more about that and how we could join together to, to maybe do something like that Sounds good. One more question here from our committee. 
again, I think we're, we'll probably need to end. Representative Harrison. Today's conversation is about work around uh, workforce development and CTEs. We've been concentrating on primarily secondary education and so it's, uh, with the dancing or a little bit around adult education. Has there been any effort to dovetail uh, what the CTEs do with what corrections do? Um, it seems like that's, that's an untapped possible source of workforce. Yeah, I think um, one of the challenges that is part of the broader sort of um, tapestry of all of this CTE work is that in some sense, we actually mirror the fragmented nature of the federal funding. So we have um, a small portion of, I believe, um, adult education dollars, I think. Do we have Perkins dollars that goes to corrections too? Yeah, so, but, but a very small amount of corrections and adult basic education federal dollars go to corrections. Um, so we, every, every um, oh, about three years when our, when our plan is needed to be updated, which varies, but it's approximately every three to five years, we do connect with connections and with corrections, excuse me, and, um, you know, ask them if there need to be any updates for um, the funding that's going to be funneled through the agency of education. I do think, though, um, it's a great question. And I know that some of that thinking um, in terms of adult technical education um, and um, corrections has in the past happened um, within the Department of Labor. And we've been part of that thinking um, par as part of um, the WIOA legislation. So um, the, the big federal bucket of dollars that the Department of Labor has, I'm just not sure where it is currently, um, but it's a, it's a great question. And I think it's one that we need to make sure we all kind of keep thinking about. Um, I'm, I don't know if we've done anything particularly innovative in that space. Um, Jay, do you have anything else that you've? Yeah, I, I, there are lots of um, threads of federal money that go to corrections. Um, we've, we've been involved in um, a, a grant that corrections received called the Adult Reentry and Employment um, Strategies, uh, AIRS grant. And so we, our um, state director for adult education and literacy sits on that group uh, along with uh, some folks from Department of Labor and Corrections and um, maybe AHS um, to, to help them strategize how to braid all of these funds um, and to come up with innovative you know, uh, um, strategies to support people as they're exiting corrections. Um, and in terms of you know how much money from Perkins goes, um, it's I think one percent of our state's allocation, which translates to um, I think it's fifty two thousand dollars somewhere in that vicinity. Um, so in in this you know the scale is not it's it's not a huge amount of money. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, my question, thank you. My question has to do with guidance counselors, and uh, you know, with this excess funding or or is or perhaps additional funding stream, it seems to me like there's a need for additional guidance counselors to help with uh, career training, uh, certifications, um, credentials, CTE planning for the CTE center, and then of course, and also colleges, but. but you know, is there a plan to, to provide extra staff in all the schools to provide more, more solid uh, planning and guidance to students for their career training? Yeah, um, I'll take an initial stab at that one. And then Jay can perhaps, again, um, Jay has been doing some significant uh, work with school counselors um, um, in the division of student pathways. So um, one of the challenges right now is, um, there, there is enough, uh, there's enough funding right now to actually hire um, counselors um, and um, staff. And um, our districts have been, have been doing that um, with the COVID dollars. One of the challenges is we don't actually have the bodies. So even if we um, were able, you know, even if we use some of these dollars that are on the table that we talked about today, the problem is that we don't have the workforce. Um, so we need to, also be um, 
And one of the things we've talked about, um, there are national um, models about growing your own in terms of um, really um, helping, um, you know, actually high school students think about becoming a teacher and think about becoming a school counselor um, and actually almost doing like, um, you know, mini internships while they're actually a student in high school um, to think about teaching careers or to think about school counseling um, as an option. So um, yes, um, you know, we wish, we wish that we had an easy solution there and could say, you know, here's some money and we'll be sure to get you some school counselors with it. But, um, you know, I know if you take a look right now at Indeed or at School Spring, which is um, where uh, education um, positions are actually um, posted, there, there's just a ton, just like there are across sectors. So um, I don't want us to, to stop there because I think we need to actually recruit more people um, with a focus towards some of these sectors that really need really need uh, critical supports. Um, I will say we have been doing a lot tighter work with mental health, and I think that you know one of the things that we're hoping to bring to bear is more state supports around um, social emotional learning and mental health, so that that can actually relieve some of the burden on school counselors, and they can get back to doing. Um, some of that work around core, um, um, you know, career advising, advisement, counseling, um, when in the past several years, most school counselors have had to really focus on, you know, triage and trauma um, in terms of um, students. And so that is one piece of the puzzle. Um, I'd be happy to come and talk about what we are interested in doing on a different day with that. Anything else you wanted to say, Jay? I think the school counselors have been really excited to kind of do this work with us because. I, I, I would agree. I think the, that they're interested and they want to do more in terms of career counseling. It's just um, capacity if they're responding to, um, you know, mental health needs and other concerns that are active at that moment. Um, it, it, makes, it makes them not available to do some of this other planning work that they really are interested in doing. What? Thank you. Um, somebody mentioned corrections. Um, I served on institutions when the community high school of Vermont was being threatened with extinction. And we had a situation where we had a lot of people advocating for what they did. We did some tours of what was going on in the correctional centers. Um, I don't know, Heather, Jay, maybe you can talk about who has the responsibility for that? Is that the Agency of Education? Is that the Agency of Human Services? I know Corrections is in Human Services. Um, those are primarily technical education. There were some literacy and other courses in there, but it's, it was, if I recall, the largest high school in the state. What is, the, where, what is your situation with that and how are you putting the technical training into that? So my understanding is that it is um, it is a component of the correction system. So it is under AHS. We don't have um, authority over it um, other than, um, as I said, um, we do function as a pass through for some federal dollars um, that the corrections education um, system is entitled to. Um, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. It's a great question. I have to go back and look and see if they are technically an approved independent school or recognized independent school. Do you know if they are, Jay? They used to be. I don't know if they still yes. are. I, I don't know if they're approved or recognized, but we have that oversight um, of them. And they, I think, are accredited by NEASC, which is the New England Association mm -hmm. of Schools and Colleges. My understanding is they were recognized high school. And we had, we had, yeah, and we had requirements that certain mem uh, members of the correctional population had to, if they were under a certain age, they had to go to high school without a high school diploma. And there was some attempts, I think at one point to extend that to people who did have high school diplomas so that they would take courses that would allow them to gain trades and, and, and training to go out and get good jobs. I mean, the auto mechanics that came out of the, out of the program that was at Northwest Correctional Center, many, many of them got really good jobs and made 
serious money. Auto mechanics make serious money, which is why it's so hard to hire someone for CTE to teach that because they make in six figures out in the right. in the in the larger world. And those those people who made the effort. Now there were some other things in corrections that are unique to corrections because we were told when we were investigating all this that the inmates didn't necessarily have to get up in the morning and go to school uh, or anything else. Uh, some of them get out of bed at three o'clock in the afternoon. But the issue is, is that the programs are there and um, they can be very, very productive. And if it's, you know, if you've got bifurcated, um, bifurcated responsibility here, you know, who's in charge, how are you connecting and working together? I mean, it makes it harder for it to be a really viable um, productive program. I don't know. Do you have anything to say to that? Well, I would also observe that because of the number of um, entities or organizations that are involved, it's probably really difficult to coordinate, right? So if they're, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the list here, they are an approved independent school. Um, we don't provide a, a high level of oversight of them, if, um, if I may. And so it's corrections is running this program and we are trying to um, find ways to connect the programs that we have oversight of like WIOA and adult education mm -hmm. and literacy and career technical education mm -hmm. to them. So if they came to us and said, hey, we want to get rid of this type of program and instead focus on training people how to code, then mm -hmm you know, we'd sure be interested in helping them figure out how mm -hmm. they could use the money that we provide to them to make that happen. And that would, that's the nature of our relationship with them. They're coming to us to say, you know, we want to do this. How could we do that? Mm -hmm. I know there is a tight connection, particularly up in the Northeast Kingdom with um, adult basic education, that center and corrections. And so it might be another, um, place to think again about that sort of um, bringing tighter connection with adult basic mm -hmm. education um, and adult technical center, uh, adult technical education. And then we could also think about and, and how is corrections fitting in with both of those? Because I mm -hmm. think that pipeline is there. Um, and I think it's, it's very um, a, a salient pipeline in the Northeast Kingdom because of the geographic proximity to um, where Corrections is, um, the St. John's Bear okay. facility and um, adult basic ed. I don't know given um, Vermont adults learning, I mean, they're, they have um, they have sort of branch offices across the whole uh, Western part of the state. So I'd have to look yeah. there, but it is another way to kind of maybe come at this and think about it. Yeah, thank you. Representative Marcot, our committee is going to have to leave. Um, I so appreciate being a part of this conversation with you and um, appreciate that we are working on a couple of career and tech uh, bills with members of your committee and that members of our committee. Um, I'm still not quite sure um, in terms of the governor's proposal. I don't have direction and I don't have a, a bill and I don't have a plan from the administration on this. So I'm unclear as to what the expectation is given we basically have one more month to pull things together before we have before we have crossover. So if there is something that you are looking for, we're gonna need it right away. Like in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to be reasonable here. Um, but I want to thank, uh, thank you, Representative Marcotte, for including us, and we will be in touch. Great. Uh, thank you, Representative Webb. We appreciate uh, education joining us. Um, and, but I would ask uh, Sec Deputy Secretary Boucher and, and Jay to stay on with us. Um, but I think there's some more questions that we'd like to ask, and um, we appreciate education joining us. And I think we, we should uh, have some more discussions together, uh, maybe getting some students and parents in to talk to us and together and to give us a better idea of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Marcotte, I am scheduled to testify with House Education um, next. <laughs> I'd be happy to come back. <laughs> <laughs> He's being poached. Heather, are you 
Yes, I can stay. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. You're leaving that meeting. I'm going to leave this meeting. Okay. And go back to our own meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an interesting discussion, but I think, in my mind anyway, if if we're not if we're not thinking about the funding mechanism where the money follows a child, and if we're not thinking about counselors that can give a full, give students the full advantage of, should they, you know, what does college look like? But what does CTE look like? What, what do the trades look like? Uh, we can throw all the money we want to at it, but if we can't get the kids into the career centers, then, you know, why spend the money? Yeah, so, um... And at the same time, um, it's really hard to, you know, legislate hearts and minds. And so I think, um, you know, it's very hard to legislate culture. So I think the way we do that is by um, continuing to um, show those who don't already understand, whether it is students, parents, or educators, really what this system looks like and why it's important and needed in our state. Um, I think there certainly are outdated um, perspectives about what CTE is. Um, and I think it's, it's really um, tricky because I think um, we ourselves who are in this space, um, we talk about trades and I think trades can pull sometimes for that outdated perspective. And I don't think that's what we mean when we say trades because trades today are not the same as trades 50 years ago. But I think people that are not um, savvy about this don't understand that. And so I think we can do a better job with that. So, you know, perfect example is um, green construction. So, you know, if you, if you don't learn now, um, and this is not my forte, but if you don't, you know, I know enough about it to be a little bit dangerous. If you don't learn now how to actually build eco-friendly buildings, um, you know, you're going to be at a real disadvantage um, in um, any kind of a, a building career moving forward. So I think, um, I think that's one of the things that um, is important is for us to be um, really clear about, um, you know, a, what, what does it mean when we say CTE? I do think we have to fix um, the governance formula and the funding. Um, one of the neat things about um, 483 is the, the, a major proposal that came out of the pilot was actually changing the funding system so that it wouldn't be a tuition-based system anymore for CTE, for secondary CTE. There would actually be um, allocations that went directly to the CTE centers. And so it would be based, it would be like a funding formula for them. But there needs to be more work done to figure out exactly how that would actually play out because the three um, entities that did that work um, to really start the ball rolling were the independent CTE centers that are their own districts. And so we need to continue to actually move that forward by looking at like, okay, now what would it look like if we did that for all of the CTE system? In addition, while we're trying to actually change the governance and make them something more unified. Does that make sense? It, it does. It, you know, I, we, we've known for a long time that the money following the, the child was was a problem. And, and this would take that away. Yeah, and we're, yeah. But we're at a point, how much longer can we wait, right? So we, you know, I, I understand the need to look at it some more, but we're, we're at a point now where too much longer, <laughs> we can't wait too much longer. I think we've got to we've got to fix this fix this problem and make sure that we're not creating another one in the schools where we're taking too many kids too many kids are going over to the career center we don't have enough kids in in the in the regular school. Um, well, that's so, why we need to actually figure that out, and that yeah. that may happen in some areas, but you know. Yeah, but I, my point is, we've known this for a long time, 
but now that we have a crisis, we're really focusing in on it. And so I'm hoping that our focus can be laser like now that we're not kicking this can down the road for another five years because we can't afford to do that. Yeah, I don't think that's the contemplation of this bill. And certainly um, Representative um, uh, Kimball has been working on it. So perhaps he can talk a little bit more about it as well. Um, I really think it's, in my view, I think what it's meant to do is to is to sew up the final details so that we would be ready with um, the new, you know, some new funding, um, perhaps even like a year from now. That's what I, I was want. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. But that's what you know. I, I I think there needs to be more testimony on it. From what I understand, I think it was just proposed in um, House Ed. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's fine. But I I just I want to I want to be clear that we can't wait much longer. Um, and we've got to do all we can to, to get this nailed down. And, you know, if we don't have quite everything, frankly, I think we've got to start trying something different because what we're doing now is not working. But, but well, I do think it's important to, have, to bring some students in and bring parents in and have that discussion. What do, you know, we don't know what their expectations are. We, we're assuming a lot. Um, from what we're hearing from everybody else, but we're not hearing from the actual people that we're, we're trying to affect. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great point. I fully support that and I would look forward to hearing it. Yeah, we, we may need your help to, to, to get yep. some students. And, yeah. and I, you know, I'm almost thinking of getting the word out to all the schools so that it gets to the parents and we have a, we might have an evening hearing mm -hmm. virtually and uh, bringing people in and having those, having those discussions with them, or at least trying to understand what, what their expectations are. Sure. We'd be happy to help get the word out and even go so far as to potentially identify some particular parents or, or students that have had good or bad experiences that you might want to hear from. I do uh, hope that folks might be interested in the virtual high school idea because I do think it could potentially solve some of the um, challenges as well. It's not, um, certainly the funding is really critical, but um, one of the barriers we know is um, transportation to get to the CTE center. And if they were doing, you know, and that is really because they're going back and forth between their high school to get their core courses and the CTE center. And so if we could, get at that barrier as well. I think that's something that um, could go a long way. And we actually, you know, we have entities such as Vermont um, Learning Collaborative, Virtual Learning Collaborative that we could actually um, set up um, like a, you know, a, a virtual high school for CTE students. We could do that. That could be something that we come out of this session with. I think it's a great idea. And, um, you know, I th think we're learning a lot you know, on apprenticeship programs, you know, electrical programs, they're all virtual and it's working, it seems to be working fine. And, you know, it takes away that transportation issue for up my way They're, you know, they're they were traveling to St. Johnsbury. So you got somebody that works all day and dri drives to St. Johnsbury at night in the winter time over Sheffield Heights is not a, not a great thing. And, you know, my son did it for a number of years and um, I think it's much easier now. And if we could replicate that, um, especially with, uh, like you said, getting the kids from the high school to the career centers, but, you know, our career center is housed at North Country, but Lake Region is also part of that. And yep. I think those kids and, and those taxpayers are getting short change because it, it's difficult to try to align the, you know, the classes try to transport them up to, up to Newport. Um, and, you know, they, they start, they, they're starting their own culinary classes at, at Lake Region um, because I'm assuming they find it easier um, mm -hmm. than trying to move those kids up to, up to Newport to, to the career center. So, um, yeah, I think it's a great idea and we should really be exploring that. 
Yeah, um, just to follow up on that point, if I may, I think one of the things that I've seen, which is worrisome in the past couple of years is, so um, high schools are also doing that. So high schools are starting programs that basically replicate what CTE centers are doing. Mm -hmm. And is that a good use of our funds when we've already invested in the CTE centers? And also, um, are they getting, you know, is the high school really equipped to teach something that really should be taught in the CTE center, but is being sort of repurposed in the high school? Like I have some concerns about that because I think, I think seeding those kinds of courses in the younger grades in middle school and in junior high makes a ton of sense. But what I'm seeing is replication of CTE curriculum in the high school, perhaps in an effort to keep students there. And, and I've testified about this in front of the committee before, as you know, Chair Marcotte, I, I don't, I think that's not a wise use of taxpayer dollars. And I also, um, I, I don't, I'd like to see the outcomes um, of those courses for students versus actually being, taking those at the CTE center um, where they actually are, when we can get them, um, highly trained faculty in those um, particular areas. Um, and, you know, maybe if we can do something with virtual high school and we fix the funding, like some of this, there won't be as much appetite for this um, because, they won't, they, they won't be losing dollars um, if a student goes to um, CTE. Having said that though, there are some tiny high schools still. And if a lot of students wanted to go, just like if a lot of students wanna to go to early college, a lot of students wanna do dual enrollment, it is putting pressure on the small high schools. So, but that's, that's, that's a whole flexible pathways issue. It's not just a CTE issue. Yeah. Emma, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to just add that, you know, I think there's a lot of things that are likely probably working well and things are not working so well and because every CTE um, campus is not built the same. And so if we were to go the path of a public hearing, I, I would, you know, in, try to do some intentional outreach to make sure that folks are coming to tell both what's working so it can get replicated, we can learn from that. Um, Burlington's numbers, for example, I represent Burlington, um, Deputy Commissioner, and a part of Burlington, sorry, part of Burlington, and our numbers went up, but that's probably for a few different reasons. One, we don't have an actual high school at the moment, um, but there's also some innovative stuff happening, so it would be, you know, I just love to learn from that so that if we do make some structural big changes that we're really um, learning from what is working in a very rural state where transportation is an issue, where duplication of programs is a question mark. This committee has you know, went, um, uh, talked a little bit about at least. So yeah, just a, it was just a general request to try to really bring in all, all types of stories along the spectrum. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Lynn? Yeah, we were talking about how the money follows the child and the schools do not like losing their students to the CTE centers. I mean, that's a, that is a real barrier and a real problem. But in the past 25 years, we've been losing students like crazy anyway. We've lost something like 30,000 students. And um, I don't know how that fits into this picture at all, but I'm sure it must. Uh, if our CTE centers are going down, I mean, just those numbers and those documents you left with the Department of Education on, on the numbers of headcounts, it looks like they're holding their own, the CTE centers. Um, they've gone down a little bit since 2019 to today, but you know, that's understandable. Um, some of them have really gone up. I mean, North country's got over 500 students in it. Um, yeah. but, that, but that's a question is what does, you know, if you lose some students, what difference is that going to make? I mean, if you can't get the teaching staff and you're losing students, cause maybe because we're losing students anyway, we don't have the number of students. We're not going to have any, we seem to have a, a birth rate that is low as as low as it was before the Civil War. So I don't know where you're gonna get these students from. And the other thing is, and I had another thought here. Um, yeah, I just remembered. You, were you around or did you participate in any capacity or follow at any capacity the, um, the famous four year vocational school between that was going to go into Chittenden County between the Essex and Burlington situation a few years back 
I've um, heard of it, but I was not around uh, in state government. Then. It was it was a really big deal. Every high school within 40 miles of Burlington had a fit over it because this was going to be a four year. I mean, you talk about this virtual learning and about bringing your classes to the, you know, that was a can of worms and it was a huge, big deal. People, I mean, Fairfax, every, I mean, we have a, a vocational center in St. Albans, but it was a huge can of worms. And um, because Burlington always been the major technical center and then Essex became a technical center and they advertised like crazy and build up all kinds of programs and they were in competition with each other. And then people from Burlington would go to Essex, wouldn't go to their own high school. I mean, it was like, that was a real tempest in a teapot. And um, I don't know, it's a tough one because there's well, something to be said for having four year vocational schools. Well, and that is what other states have as a model. And, um, you know, we did go through a very um, contentious governance um, process with our districts. And we have not done something like that um, on the CTE side or even on the adult education side, you could argue. I mean, we are losing students right now. And so that means all parts of education are losing students. I will yeah. say what is interesting about CTE is that because a lot of um, there, there was some flexibility offered with this um, committee's work actually about four years ago, four or five years ago, to actually allow younger students to take um, courses in CTE and not have to sign on for full-blown programs, we did see an increase in participation. So we did see more interest in CTE. Mm -hmm. We're a little bit at odds with how the federal government requires us to actually think of programs because they really want to see those like almost like matriculated full time <laughs> students. Um, but we did see that for, you know, a significant portion of our students in Vermont actually opening up um, some of those channels where they could actually get a taste of CTE. Yeah. They did see an increase, um, which I think. It's very much in keeping with all of the conversation we've been having, which is, you know, open up some of those channels. Don't make it so rigid that, you know, they have to jump through, you know, five hoops and that's the only way they can get to CTE. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, hi. Yeah. Um, Michelle started out this entire conversation talking about sort of prejudices and conceptions people have about about uh, technical education, and uh, and you yourself uh, mentioned that you know it's hard to change hearts and minds uh, around these kind of things, and it, it seems to me that that a certainly a a linchpin in that part of that process would be our guidance counselors, um, and and you you mentioned that of course that we don't have enough guidance counselors, and at this point a lot of our a lot of the time our guidance counselors are doing the mental health side of their counseling rather than the career guiding uh, side. But I'm just wondering, uh, you know, uh, how, how does the Department of Education, uh, education, you know, get uh, you know, information to those guidance counselors around that to help them start to change their, 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 thinking so that they aren't just everybody's going to college and if you can't make it in college well we'll send you to a tech career um, and is it through do they get regular information retraining I, I see that their their continuing education required they get uh, their licenses renewed for five, every five years and they they have to take six credits of, of CEUs uh, as someone in a profession that has to get 30 credits every two years um, I'm, I'm actually kind of shocked that, uh, that, that, that they need so little. And so I'm just curious how that, you know, how that process works. Yeah. So a lot of components of that question, it's a very good one. Um, for a long time, we didn't really have, um, a strong presence at our agency of education for, um, school counselors. I will say, um, just, uh, as a gentle, um, just a, a gentle piece of advice. Um, they don't call themselves guidance counselors anymore. They call themselves school counselors, um, which is um, 
interesting. And I think part of that is because um, they feel like their jobs expanded from being guidance counselors to being to everything in the kitchen sink. And that is still the case for them. We have some school counselors that are that are running the assessments. So they're running the standardized tests for students. They're running, you know, the, the SBAC. Um, so I think um, what we're hoping to do in the agency is actually really clarify um, and get some standards around what are what what is the role of the school counselor. Um, certainly, we provide materials regularly. Um, certainly, we were regularly before COVID um, about um, career advising, what that looks like. Um, it is part of you know they often are. Um, School counselors are part of their own national society, and that actually does have a component that is career advising still. Um, but I think what the challenge is, is at the local level, they're under considerable pressure and there aren't enough of them. And so they're just really having difficulty getting everything that they're being asked to do done. I think they wish that they actually had um, the time to actually provide more of those very traditional ways of thinking about guidance. Um, as we talked about. So we are working closely with, they have um, a state network of uh, school counselors. I actually think it would be great um, for the committee to hear directly from um, the chair of their committee as well, just to get a, a you know, a more of a, a view of what's really going on with them. Because I, I do want to make sure just as we, we don't, um, you know, it, it's hard to speak on behalf of um, students and, um, parents, I think sometimes we all can get um, ideas about what's going on with certain sectors and it might not necessarily um, be the case. Are there some school counselors that are, are really um, not tuned in to CTE and really don't have any clue? Absolutely. Does that characterize all of them? I'm not so sure. What does characterize all of them though and has even before COVID is need, is really having to deal with increased anxiety, depression, behavior problems and challenges and um, family um, challenges that are making their way into schools. And so I think that's part of, part of um, the puzzle that's really important. Um, so, and in terms of um, the standards for re, um, re-licensure, that's an interesting one. And, and I could certainly um, have our team that um, works with the licensing board take a look at that. My sense is um, they, are, they are very likely, um, they might have different licensure um, requirements that are more stringent to actually be um, licensed as a, a clinician in a different setting. So if they were, for instance, needing to get relicensed, and I don't know enough about this, as um, you know, a clinician in a mental health setting, they might be more like what you were talking about with your professional um, professional credentials that need to be updated, and there are a lot of them. I don't know. Um, my my sense is that what it looks like and what it sounds like is it's very similar to what is required for our educators. So that's probably why that looks. Um, maybe not as um, perhaps sophisticated or as much in terms of like coursework, but it's a great question. And one I can definitely um, get back to you on. I can have our director of um, education quality reach out to if you wanna learn more about that. Yeah, I'm, I think that was part of it is that if they're doing more mental health counseling essentially, then one would hope that uh, they would have more comparable continuing education requirements to, to that profession. Well, one would hope, but I think what happens is they're, they're, they're doing more mental health counseling, not necessarily because they are mental health clinicians, but within the school, there is who would take on that role. So, um, you know, one of the best models we know just from research and from, you know, looking at other nations and from um, states that are doing this right in our own country is that if you have actually a school-based clinician embedded in the school, it actually does allow those true clinical mental health services to be to be actually addressed um, by a professional who who has that kind of a license. And I think um, we have a pilot with that happening right now from with some federal dollars actually in three of our school districts in the state. Um, I just think we're not quite there yet um, as a state. And mental health has been defunded and defunded and defunded as well. So there's a battleground over that. Um, 
but these are all good questions. I think we're definitely um, really trying to make way with that and, and, and write um, the workload of school counselors to get them back in the business of providing career advising and counseling. Um, so we're all ears about how we actually do that better. Um, I think we have the right connections right now with the school counselors to actually um, have some of those great conversations. And they will have ideas about, you know, the ones we're working with want that too. So they'll have ideas about um, what to do moving forward. It, just as one example, because I could talk about this all the time because it's an area that's of, of major interest to me. Um, you know, so school counselors um, were hired, right, to, to work with students um, and, um, you know, to help them plan for what's happening after, after high school, then also um, to provide um, some, you know, social supports, groups, those kinds of things, um, but not perhaps that the level of like what a school-based clinician would do, which is really to work with someone who's, who's been, you know, who, whose needs are at like a higher level, a student or group of students. So COVID comes along and I have school counselors who are being asked to provide counseling to their peers um, because of trauma and, and COVID um, related issues. And something's got to give, right? Like that's not their job. Like their job was not to be the um, EAP officer um, for the district. And so, um, and it's not, that's not to blame the districts either. I, I just think, um, it's a symptom of, you know, not having clear boundaries and clear ideas about like, what is the role and responsibility for this particular position. Um, and in general, they tend to be folks that, that like to help. So it's hard for them to say no, I think, <laughs> and hard for them to say, I'm not going to do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it seems good. like we've changed our, how our teachers and our guidance counselors, we, we've just piled on more and more to them. They've got to be social workers. They, they, and people don't realize that, I think, that they think they need to be everything to everybody. And they can't be. They're, they're trained in certain areas. And, and we, our expectations are just, I think, way too far. And we have, we have some districts that hire social workers. And so that's the piece, right? It's about like, and I think that's on us at the agency to get um, really clear on like, here are some models that really work. The model of just expecting the school, so the school counselor to do everything is not a good model here. You know, sorry to cut you off, um, Chair Marcotte. No, no, that's, that's good. Thank you. Stephanie. Thanks. Um, Heather, I wanted to go back to what you said about, um, not wanting to replicate the CTE centers within the schools. So what I um, been thinking about this piece quite a bit and looking at my, my local school and thinking also about those numbers, those huge numbers of kids that graduate every year without any training whatsoever. So, and when I see, um, you know, there's the, there's the college track kids. Okay. They're going to go on to college. The kids who are going to this, the career technical education, they have to receive a certain level. They have, it's some, it is competitive. They need to achieve a certain grade point average in order to go to the career technical education, the CTE center. But then we're left with a chunk of kids who are not going to college and not going to CTE centers, but and are left without um, a skill after high school. And that's where I think it, it is appropriate to have some level of training within the school that is just maybe a certification or a credential, but they're not getting a they're not get graduating with a with a technical high school degree, but they're, but they'll at least be ready to get that first job. And so I, I, I you know, if someone could have a, um, what's the basic level we could have, you know, if, if we could have a, it's, um, if there's a, a welding program, or if there is a, an affiliated, uh, CDL driving, you know, something that is a course that, that, um, would get kids just showing that they could achieve a skill and they can and they can get that first job. So I, I don't I I think it's a good idea to have some basic career and technical education embedded in the schools, um, and have career technical education, uh, tech ed teachers in in the school, but not the full blown and, and breadth of the program that is at a CTE center. 
Yeah, I think um, I think this is a bigger conversation that I'd love to continue to have. Um, I, I think um, I can see it both ways, and you know, I think one of the challenges with um, taking a class or two is, um, you know, what does that prepare them for? So it prepares them for maybe that one job, but do they are they prepared for what might lie next after that job? And so I do think. I do worry, um, first of all, I worry that um, there is not um, course oversight like there is at CTE centers um, in terms of what is offered. So I don't know that um, the person offering welding um, is actually the right person that should be offering welding. I hope the superintendent knows, I don't know that. Um, welding welding is one that I'd certainly wanna make sure that they're, they're, it was happening in the right kind of space. Um, I haven't heard about welding happening in this place. I've heard mostly um, about, um, you know, well, you know, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, it's just a, it's yeah. a tech, just a kind of class like that. That's not an act. That's a it's a hands on class that might. Yeah. Just, so I, I that's not the challenge I'm seeing. So the challenge I'm seeing is you've got a sustainability. Um, program that's at the tech center literally five minutes down the road and now you've invested um, a whole heck of taxpayer dollars to build a chicken coop and um, some agriculture that you're going to do with high school students at the high school like we're just not a big enough state for that so i that's the thing that i'm really um struggling with um but you know, I think that these are these are good points. Um, I would also be very interested in learning more about what are the barriers, like why um, the student, especially as I said earlier, how we've tried to open up some opportunities for students to dabble more in CTE and not have to fully sign on for full board programs. What um, the barriers are about why why they still um, might um, feel poorly about just taking a course at the CTE. Um, one of the things I think that's also, I wish that we could actually um, see more of is to actually have CTE instructors coming into the high schools to actually um, do some of their courses there. Uh, I think that runs into um, labor issues um, from what I understand, so contractual issues. Um, so I, I think, I think I understand your point for sure. I just, um, I worry, I worry that there's, um, that that is unintentionally shortchanging students, um, as well. Um, and, you know, I think it's an important thing for us to, um, continue to talk about and think about. But there are there are a certain group of kids that are left out, right? I mean, they aren't going to, they aren't good enough students to go to the CTE. And so, where what where how do we help those kids? So, by law, all students are able to go to CTE. CTE centers don't. They're in our state. They don't have criteria that um, you know you don't have to have a certain GPA um, for students who are on IEPs. They do have to do. Um, um, some um, reviews and make sure that um, depending on what um, the students' um, challenges are, that um, safety isn't an issue. But by law, mm -hmm. students who are um, juniors and seniors, actually, no one can actually exclude them from CTE. So if that's happening, that's something I need to know about. Um, you know, they, they, uh, we're not, we're, we're not yet Massachusetts where they actually, you know, they have to actually um, apply with a certain GPA to get in. That's not, that's not how our system is set up there. So, so I think um, if that is happening in an overt way, that's something that we can actually move on. So please let me know. Um, I do think one of the challenges though, is that in some of our CTE centers, it's back to this infrastructure piece, like they, they, have more appetite, but they filled their classes. And so they literally don't have enough room to have more students. And that's a problem. But it isn't that they were excluded based on like GPA or something like that. And that's also why we want to, you know, 
figure out um, how to actually expand the CTEs where they're, they really are sort of, you know, students would be exploding out of their buildings um, if allowed to be. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Emma? I do, I, I do have to leave in just a moment because um, it's going to be four o'clock soon and I had actually apportioned um, an hour for my testimony. <laughs> I will be very brief. It's it's more of a comment than it is a question for you, Heather. So yeah, I apologize. It's okay. You can, do, you can do breathe. Um, I, I just I, when we get into structural questions around how CTs are currently structured, and just going back to school counselors just for a moment, I just think it's important for folks to remember that not every school district has the same staffing resources, and a school counselor in a very small rural district is holding away more than a well-resourced Chittenden County-based district. Not to say that they're all equal either. Um, and so when we start to go into that into that area of exploring the role of school counselors, which I think this committee would really benefit in understanding because there's such a nexus on, on what students experience and how they get guided for their career pathway on many levels, whether it's CTE, college, or even something else. Um, I think we just have to keep that in mind and think what are the opportunities to um, address that if there's a way we could think about that um, structurally as well, um, because that's a real reality that's that's making a very inequitable outcome for students based on where they live in the state, which not we're not the education committee, but that go, brings in other issues we should be seriously considering and how we can partner with the education, um, our education colleagues um, to find a better solution, because, all, you know, I think the new uh, before my time on, in the legislature, uh, attention on career pathways is such a critical one based on all the different ways kids learn. And I even think to my own experience going through Spalding High School in Barrie, I wanted to check out, you know, there's a tech center attached to um, Spalding High School. I wanted to check that out. And I do kind of remember this still, it's been a minute, but it was impossible to get into my schedule, which is another structural issue. And it wasn't that I was deterred. It was just like kind of impossible to figure it out. And so my ability to kind of get more creative about my exposure and I was probably a pretty, pretty typical college, you know, tracked kid, but um, that's that's a problem. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, not too long ago. It was long ago, but like, I think there's, you know, there's lots of pieces to sort of um, dig through to figure out all the different barriers people are facing, students are facing. And those are the barriers that are more likely happening. Those um, very subtle under the sort of, um, you know, pull back the veil kinds of barriers, which are, oh, I guess you can't fit this in. Um, the other courses you want aren't going to allow this, as opposed to, um, you know, no, you can't go to CTE. I think most educators know that you can't say that. You can't say, no, you can't go to CTE. Um, so I think, yeah, we do know that there, that those kinds of barriers, I mean, I don't think that's just Spalding. I've heard it about several, that it's about scheduling and it's about actually, um, the, the compounded effect then back to our governance structure is that then you've got four different high schools that are all having challenging problems. And so, um, so, so they have to actually, um, they have to have blocks of time across those high schools that are actually open for all students to do CTE. And that's where um, it gets really problematic because there's nothing that actually holds them accountable to actually do that other than like they have to do it as an individual district or high school but then when you're a CTE center and you're trying to actually coordinate across all of these it's really on the goodness of your colleague's heart um, in the in the high school so good work good work we need to continue to do um, please call me back um, and talk. I, I'm very open to new ideas and, and to ways to um, certainly move these two bills forward and um, get some more clarification on, um, you know, some other ideas either in this list that I've um, proposed or in some others um, as we move forward. Hi, Thanks, Michelle. Hi, bye, you. Michelle. Nice to see you. Heather, thank you. Um, we appreciate your time and we certainly will have you back in. I think, you know, our further discussions, I think we need to, you know, bring in the superintendents association, principals association, school boards association, the, the guidance counselors association, CTE directors associations. We need to have them in and, and because it, this isn't what our committee normally does. Um, we're, we're looking at workforce, but a lot of the issues are dealing with CTE and, and, and the schools and how they function. And, and also, 
quite frankly, we have you you brought it up. There's an issue of workforce within the within the school systems itself. And how can how do you know how do we deal with that? And, and what can we do? Are there things that the state can do that to make some changes there? But as we know, we don't we we don't have the answers. We won't have all the answers, and we won't have all the fixes. A lot of it's out of our control. But thank well, you. Well, I do I do think any way we can actually have these cross sector conversations on within the general assembly um, is. Is, is wonderful and beneficial. Um, as folks who've been on the committee for a long time know, I've been doing this kind of cross sector education and workforce work for a while. Um, but you know, I'm really pleased to see um, things like the joint testimony in that because um, I, I do think it's really important. We are talking about like a nexus of the two. And so, um, you know, maybe, <clears throat> maybe it needs to be another, um, general assembly committee that's on education and workforce together. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god. There you go. Well, thanks a on lot. On that note, really I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. All right. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. So, committee, um I think it was a good discussion this afternoon. We'll, we'll keep it going for sure and we keep we need to keep pushing and Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. I think you really helped to really set the stage for, for, you know, what the issues are out there. And, you know, you've been working on this for, since I can remember, since we've been, we were together on this committee and, and that was always your passion. And I think we're, we're just taking it up where you left off. So thank you. Well, thank you. So it, just to be clear, it's been your passion too. And you have been a leader in this. Can, can I just say one last tiny thing? We keep talking about talking kids into going to CTE, mm -hmm. winning their hearts and minds. Let's incentivize them. Let's make this actually the attractive option. And, and stores do it all the time. They have lost leaders for milk. I mean, we could be giving college credit a lot more than we are for CTE classes. Give credit where credit's due. There's a, we can, we should be letting kids take ATE classes at night. We should let kids take programs in the summer and get academic credit for them. I mean, if we're serious about this workforce problem, we gotta just make it work for people. And, and anyway, on that note, you're all wonderful. Right. Thank you so much. I will let you go so you can finish your meeting. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Take care, Michelle. Right. Good to see you. Hi, Michelle. Aren't we working on those things? The CTE college credit thing that we're working on that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I just want to say that and I at BFA in St. Albans, when I was on that board and when I had kids there, um, actually I went through the similar kind of thing that, that Emma's talking about. We'd sit down and we'd try to figure out. I'd never believed in study halls or anything. My kids had to have a class every single period, no matter what, no matter if we added extra classes, if we could. And uh, there just wasn't enough time to even take an interesting course at the CTE course because you had to block out this huge amount of time and you couldn't take like a, a piece of it. You had to take the whole thing. And so it didn't work. They didn't have enough time to take all the academic courses and other kinds of things they wanted. Number two, the guidance counselors are so overburdened. They're, they've got, I mean, I don't know how, how small high schools do it, but in our high school, we had a thousand students and we had... 250 counselors with every single, um, every single, 250 students with every counselor. They didn't have enough time, plus the mental health issues. My mother worked for a school psychologist, you know, other 50 years ago. So there are other positions and other people who can do this. It isn't just the guidance counselors. They're totally overworked. You know, very difficult. Yeah. That's for sure. And MVU had a little agriculture course they taught that was, we got rid of our agriculture course at the CTE in St. Albans. Well, MVU started their own little agriculture course. Never mind. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's interesting. My granddaughter had texted us, texted me when we were starting our conversations about quarter three, and she asked me what 
what I was doing. I told her we were talking about, you know, about career centers and she uh, sends me a picture. She was at, at the career center, walking through the career center at North Country. Oh, that's great. So she's in was, the ninth grade? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think she's not taking any courses there, but she was going through the center, which is good. They're exposing her. Yeah, Yeah, that is great. So um, it was interesting. So any questions, committee? Okay, so tomorrow we'll continue. I'd actually would like to know what the capacity is for these for these career technical education centers. It looks to me like they you have about five thousand kids a year enrolled in them, but is there is at the current level the capacity that it can meet? Right. Are we yeah. turning kids away because there's just no room? I don't think so. And well, maybe you could be from smaller. And certain programs, sure. I'm sure, are more popular yeah. than others, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if that's the case, then how do you how do you turn someone away, yeah. away if you aren't having them apply? Right. Right. That's a good question. Yeah. You know, also at BFA, we had a guidance counselor that worked solely with the it was the vocational technical guidance counselor. Now he worked with everybody that anyone who went to him. And I remember sit, sitting down trying to do a schedule for one of my kids with him. But that's what he was. He wasn't the regular guidance counselor. He was the vocational technical guidance counselor. And he worked exclusively, mostly with those two. So there's, there's abilities out there to do this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to say anything more. <laughs> I think we're good for the day. So I think we can go off live.